Let's take our Bibles, if you please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter uh, number 3, over the last um, several months we have been uh, studying through the book of Acts and what we are interested in. Uh, I hope we have uh, paid close attention to these first few chapters. We are interested in first century Christianity. We live in the 21st century. But our minds must be focused on what happened in the first century and how the believers and how the church conducted itself and what was emphasized in the church and may those things be true of this church. Uh, in Acts chapter number 3, before we, we begin reading in chapter 3, I want to give us a, a, just an overview of the first two chapters just to give light before we come to uh, the third chapter. We... Uh, can sum up the first chapter by saying it is the preparation of the church, right? Before the day of Pentecost comes in Acts chapter number 2, the church prepared itself, and there's two things we notice in this preparation. God gave commands. Two main commands. The first one was, wait for the promise of His coming. And they did so. The second command was, for them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the world. But those two commands go together, wait and be witnesses. So don't go out yet, just wait for the promise of His coming. And so the first part of the chapter is you see that as the church was preparing itself, there was two clear commands, but then we also see the conduct of the church in the first chapter. Two things stand out to us as to how the believers in Ch Acts chapter 1 um, acted before the church was empowered in Acts chapter 2. We see number one, their submission. Right? They go about to replace Judas, who had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, and they looked at the psalm that said that, let another take his bishopric. And so they submitted themselves to the word of God, and not only do we see their submission, but we also see their supplication. What did they do? They were in one accord, and they prayed. That is how the church prepared herself before the promise of the coming. And then we went to chapter number 2, and I can, we can sum up chapter number 2 by saying this is the pattern of the church. Think about the beginning of the chapter. First of all, there was a miracle. The miracle of the Holy Ghost was demonstrated that as the believers there were preaching, or if you would, they were declaring the wonderful works of God, the people that were listening, that, who, who were Jews who had come from around the world for the feast at Pentecost, in their different languages, they were hearing the same message in their own language. And so there was a miracle that was taking place. Sixteen uh, different groups of people are identified there in chapter number two. And we see that they all heard in their own language the wonderful works of God. And so there's this miracle that happened again. We call that a sign miracle that was prophesied by the prophet Joel who uh, said there would be a sign to the nation of Israel to prove that this would be the Messiah. And in the prophecy, Joel said that they would deny. They would not accept the sign, but yet it was prophesied. We also see the message of the church. Right? Uh, Peter, uh, basically, uh, as he attempts to respond to their wonder and their amazement at this miracle that was prophesied by Joel, he goes on and he tells them this wonderful message, which is the central message of the church. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the message of the church. Uh, and he goes on, his message, he begins by saying, Jesus of Nazareth. And he ends by saying that God hath made him, that's Jesus, to both Lord and Christ. That's the message of the church. And the message was clear by Peter. But then we see not only the miracle that happened in the church, the message of the church, but we see the ministry of the church. What did the believers, by the way, those believers that had cried out, crucify him, crucify him, now what are they doing now that they're saved? These same people now are continuing, right? They received the word, they were baptized, they were added to the church, but then what does the church look like? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, they continued in fellowship, they continued in breaking of bread, and they continued in prayer. That is the pattern of the church. That is what the first century church looks like. And so we said that if there's any alignment that is needed today in the 21st century, we, the church does not need to align herself with the culture. The church needs to be aligned with the Word of God. 
And so we find the preparation of the church in the first chapter, the pattern of the church in the second chapter. But now we come to the chapter 3. Let me give you, a, if you would, a summary of the third chapter before we study it. And that is the priority of the church. Now both chapter 2 and chapter 3 have similarities. Chapter 2 begins with a miracle. The miracle of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down and they speak in unknown tongues known to the people who were listening, but unknown to those who were giving that message. And then Peter responds to the people's amazement and wonder in chapter 2. And now we read chapter 3 and the same thing happens. The chapter begins with a miracle and the people are wondering and amazed and Peter is going to respond with a message at the people's amazement and wonder. And so notice Acts 3 verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you imagine the scene? There's a guy there leaping around. <laughs> and the Bible says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Verse 12. And when Peter saw it, saw what? The people that ran towards him and John. He answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance ye did it, and as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. I would like to bring your attention to verse number 12, and this is, if you would, the response of Peter, who, as uh, the crowd, the miracle has happened, and the crowd basically now throngs around uh, both uh, John or uh, Peter and John, and, and they're amazed, and they're wondering, and this is what Peter says. Notice in the last part of the chapter, Why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. I would like to preach a message that I have entitled, Not by our power or holiness. Not by our power or holiness. As we look at this passage, I think that there is a reason why this particular miracle is included in this revelation. Uh, we know as we study the Word of God, even the Gospels, we know that uh, there is a summary of the life of Christ that says that not all of the miracles that Jesus did are recorded in this book, and certainly if all the works that He did were recorded, 
the volumes of this work could not contain all that Jesus did. But yet there are specific examples in God's word that are taken to uh, communicate a particular truth to us or to emphasize something. And certainly during the time of the apostles, there are many signs and miracles that were done in Jerusalem among the people, and by the way, those signs were prophesied again by the Old Testament prophets, saying that what would accompany uh, as signs to the nation of Israel would be these miracles and these signs. And so uh, when we read through the book of Acts, there's no doubt we see some miracles happening, but understand these are not all the miracles that happened. There are many more miracles that happened, but yet here in Acts chapter 3, one miracle is pointed out. Now there's a reason for that. You see, this is not God in His revelation saying, well, look at all these miracles, let me just pick out one just to uh, give an illustration here. No, 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 there's a reason why this miracle is pointed out. And so I want us to consider here that as we think about the church in general, and we've been talking about the pattern of the church and the preparation of the church, but now we're looking at the priority of the church and there's a clear misunderstanding as there's always been throughout church history as to what is the purpose of the church. What does the church, why does the church exist? Uh, what is it that the church is supposed to give herself to? And there seems that in the world there's a misunderstanding as to why the church is here. Uh, what is the church supposed to be involved in? And as we look at this chapter, there is that clear misunderstanding. Uh, not only during the life of Christ, you remember, there was uh, thousands of people who followed Jesus Christ everywhere. And what, did they, what were they looking for? They were looking for miracles. They wanted something to be done among them. And ultimately, they wanted their Messiah to remove the Roman rule over them. They wanted something to happen, if you would, that was not necessarily spiritual. They wanted physical healing. They wanted to hear wonderful teaching. They wanted the Roman rule to kind of be rid of. And really, things have not changed in the book of Acts. People here, as they throng around Peter and John after this miracle is seen, they're interested in something, but they're not interested in the right thing. They're amazed at the miracle. They're wondering and they're amazed. And Peter is going to preach to them and he's going to kind of confront them as they, because he knows why they're coming to him. They're not coming for the right reasons. They're coming for the same reasons that the thousands came to Jesus Christ who then later realized because Jesus Christ did not give them what they wanted, they shouted, crucify him. You see, there's a great misunderstanding today as to what is the role of the church. And many churches have given themselves over to some uh, social platform. Even churches have become political in nature. Where all they talk about is what's going on politically in the world. Or they give themselves to things that may be compassionate, they may be good things to do. But often they neglect what is the priority of the church. What is it? Why is the church in existence today? And I believe in this chapter we find that truth. I would like to give you three things as we move our way through this chapter. We're going to first of all see a crippled man. Then we're going to see a captivated multitude. And thirdly, we're going to see a central message. Notice number one, as we look at chapter three, we see a crippled man. In uh, chapter 3, we see that Peter and John, in verse number 1, they go up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. The ninth hour would be uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so uh, by uh, pattern, by uh, tradition, the Jews would go three times to the temple to offer prayers, the morning, noon, and the afternoon. And here, this is the same for Peter and John. And by the way, they often did so, not just to pray, but to preach to the people that were there, as they're about to do. And so they come here to this place, and uh, the Bible says in verse number 2, a certain man. And so we have here, God brings our attention to one particular man, but I believe there's a reason why this particular man is pointed out. Uh, we notice three things as we see a crippled man. Notice number one, or letter A, we see his infirmity. The Bible tells us a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Uh, this man here is sitting there, and uh, he cannot walk himself. He is lame. He is a crippled. He, he cannot find a job. He is basically there at the, the beautiful gate of the temple, and the Bible tells us that he is a beggar, but understand, he can't go anywhere. He has a condition in his life that's been there since the moment he was born. He, there's nothing he can do to change his condition. That's what he is. 
We see his infirmity. We also see his inability. The Bible tells us not only was he lame from his mother's womb, notice he was also carried. Whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So we see his infirmity from his mother's womb, but we also see his inability. Understand what's happening. There's a group of people, or perhaps his family, that every day they would take this man and they would bring him to the gate, or the beautiful gate of the temple, which was one of the entrances of the temple that uh, went into the outer court of the temple. And they bring him there and they uh, basically set him there so that he can ask alms of the people and basically bet so that he can provide for himself and survive. He cannot go and find himself a job. And so notice here, we see his infirmity. We also see his inability. That, what, that is what he is left to do. That is his daily uh, duty, if you would. People bring him. He is unable to bring himself to the beautiful gate. But we also thirdly see his interest. What did he want? What is it that he, this man was looking for? We take notice of the interest of this lame man. Notice verse 2. When he, they laid him daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, for what purpose? What did he do there? He asked alms of them that entered into the temple. So the only reason why they brought them there was to do one thing, to ask alms. In, uh, notice if we continue in verse number 3 who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Now, the word alms literally means asking. So, it's basically someone who is begging. Uh, Someone who is begging for uh, money, someone who is begging for something that might help him in his condition. And so, uh, an alms, during Bible times, is anything that is given in relief for the poor as money, food, or clothing, or otherwise, something that we call charity today. That is alms. In verse number 4, the Bible says, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now that's interesting. Uh, This man is uh, asking alms, but he's not even looking at people. He is uh, infirm. He is unable to bring himself to the beautiful gate. And as he's asking alms, he's not even looking at people He's only interested in what he can get out of this situation as he's sta- sitting there at the beautiful gate. In verse number 5, the Bible says, As he gave heed unto them, when Peter and John asked him to look up, the Bible says he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Uh, expecting to receive what? An alms, money, food, uh, something that would help him in his physical infirmity, in his inability to provide for himself, that is what he is interested in. Now, I believe there's a reason here why this particular example is given to us. I believe there's two reasons. The first reason I believe this particular example is given is because of the misunderstanding of the role of religion, of true religion, is today. And the role of true religion is not to give money to the poor. That is part of it, but that is not the priority of the church. Now it seems to us as we think about church and the history of the church, there is that general misunderstanding. This man here is placed at the beautiful gate at one of the entrances of the temple. Why at the entrances of the temple? Because the people that are going in the temple are religious people. And so there is that assumption there that if he's going to find money from anybody, he's going to get that money from the religious crowd. That's his understanding. By the way, he could not do that himself. That is what the people did that brought him to the beautiful gate because they thought that if he's going to get the most money out of his time sitting there, he's going to get it where religious people are coming through. Well... It seems that many churches have become no better than just that. They have become some, uh, some uh, social group that is alive today to provide for the physical needs of those who are in need in the world. And certainly, don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that's bad. I am just simply saying that is not the priority of the church. It should be part of it. And by the way, through the pandemic, we've had people in need and we've helped them. And we ought to do that. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. But that is not the priority of the church. But that's how the world sees the church. 
And that is a problem. Why? Because the world can do that without the church. Do we understand that? The world can do charities and they do that without the church. That is not the role of the church. But that's the fundamental misunderstanding as we see that in that chapter. So I believe that's one of the reasons why this example is taken. But the second example is because of what this man communicates in the spiritual way. There's a reason why this example is given. Because think about it, this man was lame from his mother's womb. He was in a condition from birth. And he could not change his condition. And also, he is, he is unable to provide for himself. He is completely dependent upon somebody else to bring him to the beautiful gate. And his interest is uh, solely in that which is physical. He wants physical relief. Well, that speaks as to the spiritual condition of the world. You see, just as this man is born a lame and a lame man from his mother's womb, so all men, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Uh, in Psalm 51, David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And so from birth, we all have something that is part of our lives that we cannot help ourselves, and that is our sinful condition. We are unable to save ourselves and often we are only interested in that which is physical. But we understand here that there is a reason why this particular uh, uh, man is pointed out because he reflects the condition of the world spiritually. And so we see number one, a crippled man. But number two, we see a captivated multitude as we continue in verse number nine of chapter number three. The Bible says... Again, the miracle happens, if you notice, we could read in verse number uh, 5, he expected to receive something from them. Verse 6, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping, stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and, ple and, leap and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and, and uh, uh, you may say here, well, uh, why are we going to study in depth those verses here of this miracle that happened? I'll tell you why we're not going to look at it in depth, because the, the apostles never made much of miracles. Neither did Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, what is the priority of the church is not necessarily the miracle, but it is the message. Uh, remember in chapter number 2, when the miracle of speaking in tongues is happening, people are wondering and they're amazed. And what does uh, Peter do? He says, I'm going to preach to you Jesus Christ. You see what he does not do? He doesn't say, hey, let me uh, bring, uh, come over here. Let me tell you how you can speak in tongues and how you can experience this miracle. No, he preaches unto them Jesus Christ. And here now this miracle, this lame man has been basically who was lame from his mother's womb. Now he is... <laughs> Jumping around, he's praising God. This is a wonderful miracle that happened, but Peter doesn't say to the most of the day, you want to see more miracles? That's not what he says. He says, let me introduce you to the person that we call Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus of Nazareth, that's who I am interested in communicating to you. I'm not going to do much of the miracles. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter says, why are you looking at us as, as we were strange, as we have some particular power or holiness? Let me tell you who this is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. You see, the church has made much of miracles. Miracles were never intended to be, to be made much of. The message is that which needs to be the priority of the church. And so we see the uh, crippled man. We see also a captivated multitude, which tells us here the condition of the world in general. Uh, what is it that they're interested in? Well, they're interested here in the miracle. Uh, the Bible says they see this man. Uh, again, uh, this is quite amazing. I think anybody would be amazed at uh, what happened here. Uh, he is walking. Uh, he's leaping. And we know this is a miracle. It's not like he, because someone that hasn't walked ever, if you've ever been uh, kind of in bed for a particular amount of time and you start walking around, you're, you're, you, you, you're weak. Uh, it takes time, right, for that strength to be regained. That's not what happened here. He is jumping around. He is uh, praising God. He also, he grabs a hold of Peter and John. The, the Bible tells us, notice uh, in um, verse number 10, And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. 
And as the lame man which was uh, healed held Peter and John. <laughs> you see, he's jumping around, he's praising God, and he's got a hold of both Peter and John. He's holding them. Uh, certainly there would be a degree of thankfulness in his life and he wants to recognize that these men were the ones that were part of this miracle and so what happens there is because of this attention all the Bible says verse 11 all the people ran together so can you kind of see the tumult going on there there's a group of people and they see this layman who they know who he is he's been sitting at the gate for years and years and years and now he's jumping around and he's got a hold of two men and so there's kind of this uh, organic response from the crowd that was there and they rushed to Peter and John. Uh, we know why they're rushing. They want to see more. You see, if they did not expect anything else to happen, they wouldn't rush there. But they're expecting to see more. And the Bible says, they, the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, uh, greatly wondering. And so here we see a captivated multitude. The people there are just captivated by what just happened. And I want you to notice several things about this crowd. Number one, as we see a captivated multitude, we see the attendance of the crowd. The Bible says here, it uses the word all. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And so, Everybody that is there is a witness, and everybody knows who this particular man is. They have given to him over and over again through the years. They have seen him. They have known his condition for all those years, but now they see this same man, and so there's the attendance of the crowd. All the people are witnesses of, the, uh, of, of what is happening, and they, not only do we see their attendance, but we also see their astonishment. Verse number 10. And they knew that it was he which sat for the alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And so there's something, there's a stirring that's happening within them. Uh, there's not only the attendance to the miracle, there's the astonishment. They're, they're, they're perplexed, really. Some of them certainly had been witnesses of the miracles of Jesus Christ. They had been amazed as well. Uh, remember when Jesus Christ was in Galilee, people came from at least 60 miles away, and back then they didn't have cars and planes, from 60 miles away just to see the miracles of Jesus Christ. Well, here this is the same thing that is happening. There's this astonishment at the crowd, but there's also another thing that we find. Not only do we see the attendance of the crowd, the astonishment of the crowd, but also, verse number 11, we see the admiration of the crowd. And as the layman which was healed held Peter and John, and all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon, greatly wondering. And so, do you see the admiration there? Oh, let's see more. Let, let's see what, what else we can, uh, what other miracle that we can witness. We, we didn't see it happen, but we know that this man was lame, and now he's walking. I want to see what happened. What is it that they did? What is it that they said? Uh, what is it that happened that caused this lame man to be healed? And so, based on this miracle and the response of the crowd, Peter is going to respond in the very same way he responded in chapter number 2 with the miracle of speaking in tongues. He's going to respond to this miracle because now these people are held in admiration. And Peter has to respond. He has to stop them and he, he has to say something to uh, cause them to refocus and to say this is not what we are about. This is not our priority. Let's refocus on what we are here to do. And so, we see not only a crippled man, we see a captivated multitude, but thirdly, we see a central message. So in verse number 12, when Peter saw it, saw what? <laughs> the response of the crowd. You see, Peter is not troubled, right, by what the crippled man is doing. He, he, I mean, it would be natural, right, for any of us to leap and to praise God. And what is, he, what is he focusing on? He's focusing on the response of the crowd. And that's who he's going to address. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, verse 12, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And why look ye so earnestly on us? And so here he basically says this, why do you think we did this? Well, why are you acting like we should be worshipped? 
we should be praised, we should be held in high esteem, and we should be set on a pedestal. Why are you acting this way? And then he gives them a question, verse 12, And why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? So, during that time, Miracles took place. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, we would see, we'll see uh, later, there were men who were known as uh, sorcerers, men who were known to do miracles. And we see that also in the Old Testament. And people would be amazed. And they thought that, well, at times, particular people received particular powers. And remember when Christ came, uh, there, it was said that there were other Christ. Other people had claimed to be Christ. And certainly they did some, to, to, to some extent, some wonderful things. But yet they were not the Messiah. So it was not an uncommon at that time for people to, to, be, to witness some miracle, to witness something that was spectacular. And so here Peter tries to uh, shift the focus away from them, and they're trying to put the focus on somebody else. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we exist. We are not here to draw attention on ourselves. We are here to draw attention on somebody else. Why? Because we can do nothing for people. But we know somebody that can. And that's Jesus Christ. And so we find here that as they come, we think about this when he says, uh, they could have said, by our own power, but they didn't stop there. He says, our own holiness. Did you see that? That's, uh, those two are important. In other words, Peter and John says, we, of our own selves, have no power. We don't have any power. We do not have the capability to do that, what you think we did. We did not heal this man. He goes on to say later, it is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man was healed. He was lame, now he's walked. That is done in the power of Jesus Christ. It is not our own power, and we should shun, or we should uh, uh, drive away from anybody who claims to be a Bible teacher, who uh, claims to have some special power, some special ability. Today you have even billboards in Wilmington, Delaware. Hey, come to the school to learn how to perform miracles. As if by your own power you can mush up something within yourself. You could summon your inner beings to cause you to have some power. You and I have no power. The power is of the Lord. And so he not only says by our own power or holiness. You see, he says, he said, we're not even good men. You see, the, the, the idea back then was that if someone had some particular power, it was either of the devil or it was of God. And so if it was of the devil, it was something evil, but if it was of God, it was something good. And so therefore, these men are probably pious men. They're probably men who are very holy, who are very separate, and who ought to be held in high esteem because they stand out among the crowd. They are more holier than somebody else. And he says, it is not our power. It is not our holiness. We are not good men. And by the way, Peter would not have no trouble saying that. He's the one that cursed. Remember, when he was asked if he knew Jesus Christ, he cursed and denied he knew the Lord. You see, Peter says, it's not our power. It's not our holiness. Whose power and whose holiness were they about? It was about the Lord. And so, notice the message from verse 13 to verse number 18. I want to notice three things about the the central message. Letter A, we see the focus of this message. The focus of this message is clear. If you go back with me to verse number 6, notice. Peter said when the beggar expected something from them, something material, Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Can you imagine the disappointment at that time? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it'd be like uh, uh, sometimes when someone begs and they're expecting money, then I give them a gospel tract. They're disappointed. <laughs> or tell them about the Lord, and there's a disappointment. And so here, he, he is expecting something monetary, and Peter basically says, I'm not going to give you anything material. And at that point, he was probably disappointed, but he doesn't know what's about to happen. And let me tell you, the miracle that happened was much better than getting pieces of silver and gold. I mean, this man would be healed. And so... He says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee, here it is, in the name of Jesus of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That is the focus of the message. 
Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's exactly what he said in chapter 2. Remember how the message began in chapter 2, verse 22? Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles. And so we see here that that is the focus of the message. When this lame man was healed, it was not about Peter, it was not about John, it was not about the lame man. The only one who could raise this lame man up from being crippled was Jesus Christ. No one else. Uh, we notice in, in verse 13 of chapter number 3, as uh, um, Peter begins the message, he says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our Father, hath glorified His Son. Here it is, Jesus. That's who is being glorified right in this miracle, Jesus. It's not about Peter. It's not about John. It's about the, not about the layman. It's not about some power, some holiness. This is all about Jesus Christ. Verse 14. But ye denied, here it is, the Holy One, who's the, that's Jesus, and the just, who's the just, that's Christ. Verse 15, and killed the Prince of Life, that's Jesus Christ. Notice verse number uh, uh, 16, and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong. Whose name? The name of Jesus Christ. That's what they said. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And so we find here, that is the focus of the message. You say, well, what does First State Baptist Church do? What is the message? Or what is, if you would, the main work of First State Baptist Church? I'll tell you that. It is the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saves. Jesus Christ will, will heal. He is the Lord of all. That is the focus of the message. As we see later, He came to die for the sins of men. And as First Corinthians puts it, he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So our message, our focus of this message is Jesus Christ. That's who we preach. That's what Paul continually said. We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ. I glory in nothing else but save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I preach. And so that's the focus of the message. We also see, number two, the fullness of this message. I want you to see here in verse number 13 how he begins this message. He's talking to a Jewish crowd. He's in the temple. And notice verse number 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. Wait, <clears throat> what do you mean? Abraham, Isaac, and why do we need to bring uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into this picture, into this message? Well, see, the trouble today with many churches, and they've uh, kind of watered down the message of the gospel and the plan of God, where they say something like this, well, we not need to concern ourselves with the Old Testament. All we need to concern ourselves today with is with Jesus. And what I mean by that is let's kind of discount everything else. The only thing that's important is Jesus. Well, the trouble with that is that they neglect the first part of the message. Where did Jesus come from? In what has Jesus Christ been revealed? How do we know that He is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one that God sent? How do we know that? Well, we know that because He was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And remember, the promise, yes, in seed form was given in Genesis chapter number 3, where the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, but it was amplified in Abraham, where God told Abraham, uh, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And in the epistle to the church at Galatia, we know that the gospel was preached to Abraham, and when God says to thy seed, Abraham did not think of that as seeds, plural. He thought about seed, Christ. So the message that we have is not some new message that is just there for New Testament Christianity. This message is an old message that is rooted in the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And you go, go through the whole history of Israel and find everything as you look through the lineages that are mentioned in Luke and Matthew. It traces Jesus Christ. It shows the power of God, if you would, the wonderful plan of God. And he comes here, Peter basically says, we're not preaching to you anything new. This is the message of God, the message from the beginning. It is the fullness of the message. You see, we see the focus of the message is Jesus Christ, the fullness of the message, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He says, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up. 
but also we see the faithfulness of the message. He goes on and he gives the details about Jesus Christ in verse 13. Whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You, you remember that? That was not too long ago. Um, Pilate presented Barabbas who was a, a murderer, a thief, who had committed insurrection. And you shouted to release Barabbas and to crucify Jesus Christ. Now the man you shouted to crucify... God hath glorified him, and we know that since the beginning. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of our fathers. Uh, but notice here, you did this. You denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Verse 14, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by faith hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. He's talking about the Sanhedrin council and those who were conspiring to put Jesus to death. They orchestrated this whole thing. Remember, they brought in false witnesses. But the people were accommodating to those falsehoods. Verse 18, but those things, here it is. Well, why did all this happen? Why did you do this? But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. <laughs> and so, you know the message of the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and your forefathers. You remember what they prophesied about? Well, if you go to Psalm 22, they prophesied that this man who would die, this Messiah, would have his hands and his feet pierced. Uh, that was before any such form of punishment was created. His side would be pierced. The words that he would say on the cross were rehearsed in the Psalms. Uh, the Bible tells us where he would be born, when he would be born, how he would live his life, how he would die, and the purpose and the reason why he would die. And all of your fathers and prophets, and you have this record, you people of Israel, you know what's happened. You have all of this recorded in the Old Testament. It is not a new message, this message about Jesus Christ, and the message God has been faithful to accomplish. And while you, in your denial, in your anger, in your hatred, because God did not give you what you wanted, yet he gave you what you needed. You wanted deliverance from some physical ailment from the Roman government. But yeah, Jesus Christ can give you freedom from sin. God has been faithful to accomplish that. You see, that is why, why this is the central message of the church. This is the priority of the church. We're going to look at the remainder of the, this message that Peter preached to them uh, next week. Uh, but we're done here. But uh, do we understand here what the church is all about? The church is not, although these are good things, the church does not exist to go in the parking lot and deliver food for those who are hungry. That's not the reason why we exist. We exist, the world can do that. But what the world cannot do is deliver the message of Jesus Christ. And so that is the priority of the church. Let's not be distracted by the miracles. These were just signs to prove that the message was valid. That's what God said. Just like when the Spirit of God came down upon Jesus Christ as His baptism, and God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In the like fashion, the miracles were God's stamp of approval upon the church, saying that the message that they preach is the valid message. And the miracles are there to show that the message is worth listening to. And so, may the Lord help us as a church. We think about the priority of the church. I think we see a clear picture be, be, between here what the world wants. Something physical. That's why it is so dangerous today for churches to be involved in all things worldly. Let's be like the world. Let's join hands with the world. And they've become a political or a social organization and they've left the message of the gospel behind. There is no substitute for the message of the gospel. And that must be the priority of this church. And may the Lord help us to consider those truths and also to give ourselves to the things that the church give, gave themselves to here 
in Acts chapter number 3.